degradation of negrocellulose. Um, first of all, I'd like to is to acknowledge some of the people. There are quite a lot of people involved in various parts of the project. And um, specifically today, I'll talk about all the genomes I'm going to talk about. So the one going to sequence by JGI, and especially some of the really kind collaboration of um, many people in JGI, especially Igor, Bobby, Kerry, Erica, and other, many of them you know quite well. And also the groups of DSM are heavily involved in this. And there's also, I'm going to talk about some of the work in collaboration with um, Frank Collard at Argonne National Laboratory and Scott Baker, Alan Polensko, and, Alan, uh, and John Mannerson on the work. So I was trying to see if I can remember um, crediting them as I go along. So, I don't need to get an introduction you know, to this topic. And um, as Eddie Rubin pointed out, you know, we, we have a situation, and that is the cost of the enzymes in breaking down uh, cellulosic biomass is expensive. And at the current moment, you need about 25 grams of enzymes to convert about one liter um, of ethanol. That's if that's the benchmark. And according to the industry, like, you know, a penny a gram, this is as cheap as you can go. So the only other way you can bring the price down is to finding more efficient enzymes or enzymes that we can recycle it or some other way to make it cheaper. Uh, what is the situation? Why is this the case? And so what we do, first of all, we can look at is what are all the fungal enzymes being characterized out there? So we systematically look at all the genes linking to the literature and every single one of them and find out how many of these enzymes have been characterized. It turns out it's not that many. Total up to now, we only have 360 fungal glycosohydrolases that's been reasonably well characterized. And out of that, only about 120 are encoding cellulases. And if you look at it, so the also more surprising is that if you look at the phylogenetic distribution of these enzymes being characterized, what we find is most of them are really in one or a couple of species, like the aspergillus is 106, you know, 133 of this 360, so about a third of them are coming from aspergillus. And with aspergillus, so the Niger is the most with 43, and trichoderma and rhizobotoricea, you account for over 50% of all the enzymes being characterized. Right? So there is a whole lot of diversity out there. And if you now drill in into the cellulases and ask what kind of properties we have, and you see, not, again, it's most of these enzymes working at slightly acidic pH, and they're fairly moderate temperature in terms of its optimum temperature, and also, but they have fairly wide range of specific activity. But again, we call caution, this is a very small number to deal with, but if you base on this, they say, like, the GH3, uh, beta glucose today seems to have a high specific activity in GH1, and also the GH45 and the gluconases seems to have a high specific activity than the other in the gluconases. But we're not clear this is really the case or not. So clearly, this is setting a stage. There is plenty of diversity and plenty of genomes. We haven't looked at that, and let's see what we can do about it. And this promised a project that we've initiated about is the official part of this part of the project is only initiated about six months ago and supported primarily by Genome Canada. We call it a Genosign project. What we're doing is we sequence some of these target fungal genomes, we annotate them, and then we use the transcriptome analysis and also exoprotein, looking at the, what kind of exocellular proteins there are and trying to see if we can, getting out of them, the strategies used by these fungi in breaking down the cellulose and whether we can use that to guide the development of enzyme cocktails. And to go further down, we're also going to make enzyme of these, characterize them biochemically, and if cases we want to improve, we're trying to do direct evolution on them. And then we just ship along whoever collaborators and anyone want, you know, want to collaborate to test them in different, different parts. All right? So what I'm going to try to do is just focusing on these top parts this central part right down to some of the biochemical characterization of the project. All right, what are the genomes we look at? Again, we would like to look at as evolutionary diverse as possible, but at the same time, we are realistic as to what we know, 
And we're also focusing primarily at the root rotors, um, thermophilic fungi, and also the rumen fungi. And those of you going to the, yesterday, there's a poster by Don Nick Victor who will tell you is that uh, thermophilic fungi is really only a narrow, two narrow branch of Ascomyces we know of. One is coming to Eurasia, and the other one is uh, Sartorio. There are these two areas that we can find thermophilic fungi so far. And also, in the case of some of the mucoids, it seems to be also thermophilic. So we are trying to, essentially, we're going to do every single one of thermophilic fungi we can get our hands on. All right? If you have some well characterized, let us know. Um, so we'll sequence this, annotate them, um, then we'll do the transcriptomics. For us, the important part is the genome annotation. At the moment, using RNA-seq, we get, as you can see, very good coverage of RNA data in the genome. And we can use that information to help guide the annotation, either by the novel assembly of the transcript, we've been getting, you know, it's improving, getting better and better, or just mapping in the genome and then reconstruct those transcripts and making some of these models to guide the annotation. That's one of our ma major focus on that. And obviously, the other thing we're going to study and trying to look at is the regulation. And we use, the platform we use is the Solexa, uh, Illumina uh, platform, and RNA-seq method. And we've done quite a bit of sort of control, making sure, like, the scale here are quite narrow, just to show, you know, the biological replicates are decent, a fairly, fairly good correlation. And then we're going to look at this, again, we mostly, we are always looking at is the type of substrate used, a very complex substrate. Priest straws, alfalfa, barley, canola, corn uh, from a mechanical pulp and so on, right? And so far, in terms of the agricultural straw, this is sort of, in the near terms, expected to be our energy feedstock. We find is there, there is some good, reasonably good correlation among the dicots and also recent good correlation among the monocores as to the type of genes they express. And we will get high expression of these hemicellulases from the dicots like alfalfa and so on, and whereas we get a high expression of the cellulases. What about going down further a bit, because we obviously, you, you can't see all the genes in here, so I'm gonna just zoom in again as so one looking at is one particular or two classes, you know, the GX6 and GX7, um, cellulases. And you can see, like, these are the scale, you know, looking at is the, how many tags we get per KB of transcript per million reads. And you can see within these classes, not all these genes can be detected. Some of them are just not expressible. Under, well, certainly not in glucose, but not even in barley being in, uh, induced, all right? Some are highly expressed, are fairly well expressed. The, if you look carefully in here, this is not from a single species. This is from two different species altogether. All the GX6 and GX7 cellulases are from two species. One in here is the Mycelophila formophila, and the other is uh, Philathia terrestris. Okay. The interesting part, as you can see, is that like these two, the CBH6A from um, Mycelophila and um, also from the Phalathia, both of them expressed in here, like 7A from the two species. And whereas the other ones, the 7B, they're not expressed at all. So this is really confirming, I mean, obviously, well, you can say this is obvious. The orthologs in different parts, different gene, uh, species, they are under the same control. They should be regulated. It is obvious, but from our perspective, this is still a very important point to make. Because if we can extend the type of analysis to several other species, then we can say that from future, if we want to break down barley, maybe we're focusing on the awful logs of CBH7A and not bother to touch a CBH7B. So this is basically, they come back to the, one of the major goals of genomics is just based on sequence analysis, we can have a very good prediction of what is going to happen. So I think, you know, that means, you know, if we're going to do a few more of these, we may not need to do any more transcriptome analysis. We just based on the sequence and this one, this one, and this one, and we choose. Okay? So next thing you do is, again, we're trying to do is to integrate this data 
to get the uh, exoprotein mix. And what we're doing in here, we have developed what we think is a fairly robust uh, analysis pipeline for picking out fungal secreted proteins. And this is multiple steps, but this thing we have automated it and make it, hopefully once we get going, uh, we'll really smoothly, then we'll make it totally available to everybody who can crunch in own things and analyze them. Now, we think it's quite good is that is, at the end of this, we have done it quite a bit is that this is about 98% sensitive and as well as 98% specific, which means if we run any genome, which is quite good, but still we'll be missing about 2% of the gene encoding secreted protein. But even one thing which is problematic is that even though it's 98% specific, that means we're going to miss call 2%. In other words, 2% of the intracellular genes encoding intracellular protein will call it extracellular. And its average genome is about 10,000 genes, we'll miss call about 200 genes. So there's still a lot of mistakes. And we're trying to improve on that. And the only other way we think we can improve is using an evidence-based um, approach and also use that to develop new set of tools. So that's why we're going to quite a lot of it is to grow the fungi in different substrate, get the extracellular protein, and analyze them by mass spec, and then combine them with the computational uh, analysis, what we call as a verified secretome. And for us, another part is important that is because we would like to look at is some of these so-called pioneer proteins. Proteins, by sequence analysis, we don't know what they do. And now, if we know at least they're secreted, maybe we can get it out and try to work out what kind of things they do, all right? And again, before we go on this, like, I'm fond of mass spec analysis on uh, protein, as far as we're concerned, at least in our hand, it's not still it's not as robust as genomics. So we again, we like, uh, do a various type of control and various technology, including various mass spec. This is in collaboration with uh, Sylvie Labrosier from Genome Quebec and also Ellen Pinisco from PNL. Uh, what we did is, again, we used the same sample, several biological replicates, run through different pipelines, run through different mass spec, and trying to see which one would give us the most quantitative type of analysis. And you see the, the hierarchical clustering to show it's a reasonable good correlation. They are fairly you know, reasonably quantitative in each of these things if you do enough times, all right? And, but different methods, different mass spec give you somewhat different results. And we have to try to sort out as to how we're going to integrate it with the other analysis and which is more reliable. Uh, we, what we do is to, the idea is then again, we culture the fungi under different feedstocks, look at the mass spec profile and what did they do. And this is, again, what we want to look at is the, the cellulases. And these are number type of agricultural straws we use. Um, as you can see is, one thing I want to point out is that not all the genes, just like the transcriptomes, not all the genes encoding these proteins can be detected. These proteins, especially in the gluconase and beta glucosidase, a lot of them, we cannot detect in the extracellular medium. And you can see also that some proteins are much high, we detect much higher level than others. And we also, again, find this, the, the, the pattern that we kind of see it in the, also in the transcriptome is that is, there is a distinction between the high expression, some of the um, type of genes in the monocots separate from the dicots. So, you know, obviously individual straws give it slightly, you know, fine, specific uh, pattern, but we can see also a broader pattern between the monocots and dicots which is not surprising because they have different ratio of uh, hemicellulose and the uh, cellulose. Uh, so one obvious thing to do is to try to, is to see if we can correlate the transcriptome data and the exoproteinome data. Right? So we're trying to see the level expression on the transcriptome and the exoproteome. Do they look the same? Um, that's the next slide. That's the correlation. I don't think I need to give you much explanation to say that this is not 
with a few exceptions, we don't get very good correlation. In the last two days, I met with many of my collaborators. We're reviewing these results. Uh, one of my collaborators, you're not going to show this. If you show this, please take my name off. Uh, and the JGI folks tend to be very polite. They were very quiet, you know, saying, but you can hear their eyes rolling, you know, what was going on with this. But interestingly, uh, some of my colleagues from DOE, as far as the, especially from the enzyme company, from Novozyme, they said, this is what we expect to see. Right? One of the problems with one of these analysis comparison with the exoprotein is that, well, there are many, many, but major part two is because we're working on these straws. And what is happening, the enzymes, once they go out, the ones that are floating around, they're not doing much. The ones that are actually doing the jobs are tightly bound to the substrate. All right? And we are using 2% substrate. We actually, I have literally destroyed a graduate student trying to get him to work on these things on 20% substrate concentration. For two years, he managed to get about five micrograms of protein coming out. Because all the proteins are bound. You cannot bomb it out of there. So in some way, you can, you know, counterintuitive, maybe the stuff that is bound are the more useful one rather than one floating around. And similarly, like yesterday in talks on um, Eddie Rubin, he was looking at those things that bound to the substrate. He wasn't looking at them floating around. There's a good reason for that. So don't, you know, feel, uh, curse me on that. Maybe I put my name of my collaborators back on. So he, he was feeling quite good after all this explanation. So it comes down to this. We still don't know what's really going on. We need to really have to go to the next level as to clone all these genes, make recombinant proteins out of them, look at them biochemically, test it back on the feedstocks, and then ask which one are they really going to be important. Even those that are not expressed, are they actually still very good? All right? So that's where launching this uh, a genome my approach. What this approach is, we're going to, at least for a few species, what we'll do is any genes that we can predict to encode the nignocellulotic enzyme, we'll clone and express them. Also, any protein, we may not know the function, but we can detect on the mass spec in the exoproteum, we'll clone them, express them, and find out what they do. All right? Uh, the initial part of this is uh, in collaboration with Frank Collado sitting there, and, uh, Scott Baker, and, uh, and John Mendelson. What we do is we take Aspergillus niger, because this is already the one I mentioned is the most 43 has already been published, so we have a lot of information. We have fewer things to do. But there are 239 glycotrohydrolases. And so we're putting through some of the program. We're cloning in different hosts because um, the researchers who are still working on directed evolution and structural analysis, they like to work with E. coli. And then in the lab, people like to use PIC here because it's you know, easier to transform. But in industry, they use Aspergillus or Trichoderma. And most of them use Aspergillus niger to begin with. So we're going to try to put through all these and see what happens. Not surprisingly, I think mean, you know, any of you who work on this in E. coli, you can express this protein really well. As you can see in here, this is uh, Frank's work. You can make tons of material coming out. But most of them are not soluble. Only 25% we can in very kind of solubility, all right? And peak here, this is, like, I wonder, like, these numbers, 62% expression rates, these are very high. This is not something you can normally do. We, we are being very generous. Anything we can see a band, anything we can detect, we call it. So it's not, not all of them are highly expressed, okay? And we're using Aspergillus gene as a uh, template, but even that, we don't get everything expressed. You know, to going back to the same host, we still don't get everything expressed. All right? So this is, you know, but these are fairly good number. And next thing we do is to try to characterize the proteins coming out of these different hosts. Now, this is getting us a little bit nervous because it turns out some of them work quite well across different hosts. But in many cases, we find the enzymes produced by peak here tends to be less stable. 
like in here, the temperature optimum is actually even, you know, 40 degrees, right, uh, we are being generous. But they are much higher when they're expressing as vitreous nitrogen. All right? And surprisingly, too, is in some cases, the specific activity, like in this case, there's several orders of magnitude difference. I'm not trying to say one system is better than others, but we're going to have differences uh, between different holes. So we have to go and say, like, uh, I don't know how do we solve it, right? Um, we're going to analyze some more. Frank and I, we were already talking is uh, we're doing some structural analysis and so on, trying to see what is going on in these cases. And why is it consistently, it's very peak here, they're less stable. And what, what can we do about it? And, but those of you working in genome project, you know we can't wait. We have to push. The number has to come. So we push forward, and we'll use Aspergillus niger as the host to grow these proteins, because most of the template come from is going to come from the filamentous fungus. So this is also, and also industry like it. All right? Uh, Having a genome sequence is really wonderful in many, many ways. I don't need to say Because we know then quickly, one afternoon, you can figure out what all the secreted protein during fermentation is there. And then we can spend the next few months knocking all them out, one after the other. And then you can have cell a fairly clean strain. So we have used this so a clean strain, like in here. These are not purified protein. These are simply, we take half a microliters from the medium, dump it on the gel, that's it. All right? You don't need to really, you know, purify them. Well, you, 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 obviously, you, want to, you still need to purify if you want it pure, but it, you can just, for screening purposes, one thing, we can just move. Okay? Uh, so, again, is when you do that using heterologous system, what we, our success rate is about 45%. This is as good as we, but we, we are a little bit more stringent. We need to, in a micro plate, we would like to see at least 100, gram per, 100 microgram per mil before we're going to move to the next one. Now, we have no idea why some of these, we, we work all the time trying to figure out why are them, some of them are not expressed. And now we're going to say, well, can we compare these with the, um, the transcriptional profile? Is there any correlation of the exoprotein profile where they express or not? And basically, the answer is no. Or at least so far, uh, we, we, we still hope we're going to see a pattern later. Right? So logically, we say there must be a pattern. And we'll keep going and going. And with time, hopefully in a couple of years, we'll get enough data. We'll come up with some kind of pattern. We can make more better prediction. Okay? Um, I want to make a conclusion. Uh, there's some of the conclusion that you make from this is, is again, to reiterate there are only a few fungal enzymes, less than a couple of hundred um, fungal enzymes for nucleocellulose degradation have been characterized. And the various omics approach will give us a very fast way, not only identifying these proteins, but also help to understand the regulation and future make better prediction. The other conclusion is that the making recombinant proteins is very much dependent on the host. And I think we have done the largest sort of cross-host analysis, and we are not happy with it, what we find. There are a lot of challenges ahead for us. Uh, one is that, you know, we, in order to get all this work that we would like to do in future and make life a lot easier, we need a few genome really well curated, all the genes curated. And we also see if we can get the community together that uh, we can analyze or annotate each genome with the same or some, at least some standard in the pipelines or perfectly the same analysis pipeline that we can actually compare genomes. Otherwise, we are talking apple and oranges. Uh, last but not least, uh, we need new tools for integrating all these different data. And I think in many of these, certainly I hope JGI can take a leading role or if not, assuming all these works. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? I was just curious, could you generally comment on when you think about prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cellulases? 
who's the workhorse in a given environment? Is it, it must be a blend, and it depends where you are. But Eddie seems to be finding cellulases that are mostly prokaryotic, and you're talking about fungal ones that are eukaryotic. And what's, I, I what's think, uh, well, we'd like to, whatever is most active, really is. Uh, for, because, in, well, prokaryotes, and most of them, the anaerobic environment, those enzymes are organized in scaffold in the uh, cellulosome. So they're in an engineering standpoint, it's not easy to work with these guys. They are just floating around. And as I said, the industry goes in the next little while because the current mix is on fungus, and they will probably work on fungus. But certainly down the road, the, I, I, I don't think there's really one dominant. You know, I, I think we have to look at, at this stage, it's too early to jump into any particular path. <laughs> Adrian, a nice complex of problems. <laughs> Thank you, Marvin. I, I thought you were appreciate that. <laughs> it's sort of progress. I just wanted to comment uh, on the possible roles of the uh, uh, pausing dicodons. You know, in, in many species, yeah. there are icodons, which cause pausing, uh, likely in all, pausing in translation to allow the newly synthesized polypeptide stretch uh, a chance to uh, properly fold. But for the proteins which are normally designated for an extracellular export channel, that type of pausing might actually get you in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that might be an angle worth, worth looking into. We, we have a look in all the things in terms of the structure and specific codons in the rare codons in the domain, outside domain. There are some things. I think the data set is still small enough. We, we can't really say this is it. So we, and we have changed many of these things. We completely changed the codon to the so optimized codon. Some of them works better, some work less. And actually, one of them, perfectly optimized codon, we couldn't get any expression at all. So I, I'm not giving up, but <laughs> you know where I'm getting at. I think it just simply, we at this stage is, Completely diversity search and see what is going on first. So, so many of the cellulases you talked about had a, a high optimal um, uh, enzymatic uh, operating temperature. Are there, um, among all these fungi, cellulases whose optimal temperature is lower, which would, would be in a range more uh, amenable to expression in heterologous systems? Uh, well, how low, some of them working around 30 degrees. The problem is, again, well, I, I don't want to sort of emphasize the point is, up to now, most of these proteins, when they characterize their expressing recombinant the system, if they're expressing PQ or an E. coli, what is their true properties? And that's where we think we may need to go back again, what's going on first, right? And, and maybe, again, it's all these cases we're dealing with we can only characterize this thing and express. As you pointed out, if they're not expressed, we can't do anything. 